Welcome to the Source of Commercial Real Estate, where we talk to the experts in non-residential commercial real estate so you can grow your business, find a competitive advantage, and use real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek, and today I am talking with Michelle Klingenberg. Based in JLL's Cincinnati office, Michelle has over 10 years of experience in the greater Cincinnati real estate market as Senior Vice President Michelle is responsible for growing JLL's Cincinnati's agency leasing business, recruiting talent to join the firm and build relationships with Cincinnati business community and commercial real estate property owners. Beyond her day-to-day -day JLL responsibilities, Michelle is working toward a greater vision for the firm to position Cincinnati as a preferred city for businesses to operate and establish as their headquarters. She aims to maintain JLL's role as the premier local commercial real estate leader and to continue to uplift Cincinnati's economy. Michelle, I am sincerely looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me. Michelle, you have a really interesting and inspiring background and um, your story of how you got into commercial real estate, I, I personally find very inspiring. Would you mind taking us through your background and how you got into commercial real estate? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I was in college um, at Northern Kentucky University and I still did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, talking through options with my parents, my mom worked at Procter & Gamble. She was on the facility side um, for JLL on the P&G account. And she said, hey, we have a position. It's as a lobby receptionist at um, Procter & Gamble, but it was a JLL position. Why don't you come do that until you figure out what you want it to be? So I did that part time. Um, and then I went to HR soon after and was like, OK, I really like this company. I love everything that they're doing. Um, I think I can really provide some value here and do bigger and better things for the company. What else do you have for me? And at the time, everything was under my mom's umbrella. You know, she ran a big portfolio, so I couldn't advance up the chain under her. So I went to HR and they said, you can come work in our brokerage office and, you know, you can interview over there for a marketing position. I didn't know what brokerage was. Um, that was new to me. Um, but I said, okay, great. Love the company. I'll figure it out. So I did and I interviewed and they said, can you help us kind of elevate our properties? They explained what they did. And I said, yep. Did that for about two years, worked under the brokers and the senior brokers in our office for industrial and office mainly. And soon after, I was like, this isn't that hard. I'm going to get my license and um, become a junior broker. So there was a position for me to go under some senior leads in our office. And um, that's how my that's how I came about into the brokerage world. Michelle, can you talk about, um, you know, that was over 10 years ago. Um, so can you talk about along the journey? Have there been mentors or other people either within JLL or outside of JLL that have been impactful and instrumental in you rising to the position that you're at now? Absolutely. Um, so mentorship has been so important to me because without it, I wouldn't be where I am today. So my mother was certainly my first mentor to get into um, the company and into a career. And then once I became a broker, I really had to rely on some senior brokers to show me the ropes. Um, it's kind of a sink or swim out there. And unless you're lucky enough to have somebody to teach you um, what you're supposed to be doing every day, it's tough. Um, so I had some senior brokers that I felt like I could also help at the same time. So it was a really good working relationship. Um, when you graduate or get your license, I'll say, um, your real estate license, they really only teach you about residential. 
So without someone there that can kind of take you under your wing and say, this is how you're going to see a deal from start to close, um, you, you need that. So I'm working really hard to give back to those who have uh, mentored me along the way and set me up for success because I want the same for those that I mentor now. You mentioned um, adding value to some of the senior brokers that um, helped you. Um, as they were mentoring you, you would also help them. Um, what are some of the ways that you added value or helped those senior brokers that were helping you? Yeah, so at the time, um, brokerage seemed to be very, it was all about the transaction and it was very black and white. And there were companies that were, you know, just looking for the best value for their real estate. And I do feel that as a young female coming in to help some of these, um, we'll call them senior males who may not have had, um, a creative outlook on how they can market their property to appeal um, to the companies who are looking to grow talent. So I felt like I was at a similar age at that time that I could say as a young employee, this is what I would like to see. So it was um, just a different vantage point that, um, and so that part for sure. And the other just being I felt like I could bring some organization to their process. You know, when you look at how they've been doing the same transaction deal flow for the last 30 years of their career, it's taking a step back and saying, okay, well, I think we could do this a little differently. So. I really enjoy um, talking with and interviewing females in commercial real estate uh, because I'm with you. I think um, females can just bring a different perspective, a different skill set, and a different way of looking at scenarios that some of the uh, the alpha males might struggle with. And, and um, so I know, you know, you've experienced a great deal of mentorship from others. And I'm sure now that you're in your role, you're passing down mentorship to others. And I imagine trying to get more females involved in commercial real estate. Can you talk about in your experience, what makes a good mentor? What makes the great mentor stand out to you? So I, I hope that I am living by what um, I think makes a great mentor, but I think first and foremost is it has to be a two-way street. So I'll give you my time and hope that I would get some tidbits from them as well. So the same things that I was providing to my senior mentors early in my career, I also like to hear from those that I mentor what I could be doing differently, you know, because now I've been stuck in my kind of role for several years. Um, also, the young and up and coming into the commercial real estate field, they're really good at tech. And while at one point I thought I was, you know, the most hip with tech in my office, tech changes so frequently. And um, I do feel like incorporating tech and social media, for example, into our everyday business is something that we could really lean on to have some younger mentees help with for sure. Um, but so giving time, I think is a big deal. And then making it two ways, making sure that they also feel like they're contributing to this relationship. Um, and I never want anyone to feel like they can't come to me if they have questions and I'm available at any time. So we do a lot of coffee meets and a lot of phone chats for sure. I also bring them with me. So it's good to see like touring office space and hearing what different prospects are looking for. It gives them kind of a glimpse into a day in the life, which is different every day, which is why I love it. But, um, I'm an open book, so it's like whatever you need. If you want to come along or if you just want a high level, I think that's helpful. And just in the few minutes that you and I have been talking, you're clearly someone that's easy to talk to. And so I find that 
you know, in mentors that I've had in my life, that's also something that, you know, you can't quantify. It's just like, wow, Michelle, like, I know I can go to her for anything and she's not going to judge me and she's not going to, you know, come down harsh on me. Um, so I, I imagine that's a great, uh, a great attribute that you have in, as you mentor others. Uh, Michelle, let's get into kind of your work at JLL. So um, I read through your bio. Um, I've looked through some of your listings and some of your recent work. But for the listeners, why don't you go through some detail about what do you spend your time uh, doing mostly right now at JLL? Sure. Um, the majority of my business is in agency work. I represent a lot of landlords, probably over 100 active listings in Cincinnati right now. It's my passion. Um, I certainly can sprinkle in some tenant rep work, but agency is where I feel I thrive. I love um, a deep connection with, with each one of my clients, and I feel like I know and understand their goals, and their goals become mine too. Um, so I feel like we it work really well together with my clients. And the other is the other brokers in the market are my clients as well. I treat them like that. Um, I have a really good relationship with all of the tenant rep brokers. And I feel like they all know they can bring their client to my building and I'm going to mother that tenant, take care of them. And they can kind of relax a little bit. They don't, you know, I'll make sure nothing slips through the cracks. And I feel like that's um, helpful in the agency side. So mostly agency business. Um, just recently, I started growing my own agency team. So that's been new for the JLL office. Um, I'm on a team of five. And there's three of us that focus on office agency. And we work really well together and it's kind of running like a well-oiled machine. We all have our place. Um, most of my days are spent showing space. I pretty much work out of my car um, and I do proposals all day long. And that's really, that's really it. <laughs> Great. Well, I am super interested to hear, I mean, it sounds like you are in the trenches, particularly in the office world. So I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, from a 30,000 foot view. Um, and I know you can only speak to, uh, you know, the, the Cincinnati market. Um, sure. So that's totally fine because that's, that's where you're, that's what you're experiencing right now. But give us a 30,000 foot view. Um, what are you experiencing as you're showing office space all day? Um, kind of what are what are your thoughts and what patterns are you seeing right now? So I'll first start by saying, um, contrary to what you may have read, office space is not dead. We are so <laughs> busy. We show space all day long. And I will say that since COVID, um, and I hate to keep referencing that, but there's just been such a shakeup in our market. So office is alive and well, it's just different. So we are seeing so many companies now like, okay, we know our plan moving forward. And I do think that the hybrid model is here to stay. I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, but in Cincinnati, at least, the companies still have to have some sort of presence. You need to have some office space. It's just um, not as dense as it was. And their teams may be coming in on different days. And I think the space is, most of them are being used as more collaboration space and they still do their home, their heads down work at home. And then they come into the office to meet and collaborate. And I think it's a really good mix. So a lot of what I'm seeing in the market right now, it is a downsize, um, but it's not a bad thing. So I call it a right size actually. Um, and companies want to be where their employees want to go. So at one time where a financial where financial was the main driver about real estate, now it's more about the vibrancy of the space. Companies want to make their office better than any work from home situation. So 
fully amenitized, having a fitness center, a place to go eat, walkable, really, um, that's been the driver. So all of our class A fully amenitized spaces are doing really well. And that's what's going to come down to our owners, whoever's willing to invest in their building and provide these amenities for each of their companies are going to be the ones that do well and come out on top. Okay. So that is, that's really helpful. Um, it seems like there is this almost like a dichotomy from class A um, we've been hearing that Class A is doing really well. And of course, the media um, and the headlines will say, you know, paint with a broad brush. Uh, all office is doing terrible. All office is in the toilet. And, um, you know, we in the industry know that that's not true and that there's a lot of nuance um, based on the amenities and, and the type of structure it is. Um, so talk to you represent over 100 landlords. You've got to have some space that's sitting or that is not desirable that you're get maybe you're getting showings on maybe it's priced right but for whatever reason it's sitting how are you advising your landlord owner clients that have space that's sitting so basically showing them trends of what these other buildings are doing that we can recreate so putting money into the lobbies, putting money into the tenant lounges, adding some sort of food element, um, the fitness center, trying to invest money into those types of um, amenities on site is really helping um, quite a bit. Um, the other thing is, it's just, it's gonna come down to location. So there's going to be some buildings where you can do that all you want, but if it's not in the right spot, they're still going to struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you talk more about the types of spaces that are transacting um, and what types of spaces are sitting? It sounds like highly amenitized, great location. Um, those spaces are moving. Um, any other thoughts in terms of, you know, what landlords can be considering if they know they've got they're anticipating some vacancy or they have some vacancy, what, what other advice would you share? So the first impression is my number one thing that I say um, to each one of my landlords when we're getting space back. A lot of times when we're getting space come back on the market, a tenant has been in there for five to 10 years and it doesn't look pretty anymore. So sometimes, pulling up the carpet and painting all of the walls a white or light color um, really goes a long way because as soon as you bring a prospect through that space, you're going to be discounted if they can't see through its existing condition. So it might include proactively opening up some walls and making the space feel a little more inviting and um, able to be reused for other people's use for sure. Great. Yeah. How about, um, I'm sure you have some interactions with tenants. Um, can you talk about either in your showings or feedback that you're getting from tenant reps? Can you talk about what are tenants looking for? We've, um, you know, we, we have hit on that a little bit, but what sort of feedback are you getting from tenants in terms of what they're looking for? Um, and in terms of space and amenities, but also timing, pricing, TI, what are, what are tenant expectations right now? Yep. So majority of the tenants, their big things are now employee driven. So what my employees want. Um, so on top of all of the amenities, they also, some of them at least, want something quick. So really cool space. They may not have a long runway that we used to work with um, in the years past. So our spec suites are doing great. So anytime an owner proactively goes in and builds out space and furnishes it, those have been going pretty quick. Um, in addition to some of our really high-end sublease space, because it's move-in ready, they don't have to think about it, and the furniture is existing. So it's kind of like a plug and play. So those are well, 
Employees are also really focused about accessibility and how close the new building can be to each of their employees' homes. So that's something I'm hearing quite often. In addition to move-in ready, they want to make sure that it's close to, they want it convenient um, and cool. They just want it to be like a place that you want to go hang out at. So. Yeah, that is, it is so interesting for me to hear that, that these prospective tenants want these quick plug and play, even furnished. Uh, because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but historically, a lot of tenants want, you know, they want to be responsible or they, they at least want to say in the build out and the furniture and how everything is going to look and how everything is going to be arranged. And it's, it's interesting to me that there's a growing demand for um, people wanting quick, you know, a quick turnaround on the lease and to be able to move right in in a furnished space. Well, with that comes, I think it's taking tenants a lot longer to make decisions. And it's because right after COVID, people thought, okay, I've got my plan. And then just last year, it was like another blip of, wait, do we? Is this really what um, we think we should do? So it's almost like they've waited so long to make a decision. So I think that is a main driver of the quick occupancy need. They don't have as much time. I think they may be up against uh, lease expiration. And even then, we're still seeing a decent amount of, we still need to kick the can down the road. So kind of all over the place, but um, it's, it's still good. I mean, companies are still transacting. It's not like the entire market is just saying, everybody go work from home. That's not, that's not what's happening. <laughs> Thank you. And are you, I've, I've heard from, uh, from brokers and other asset classes that they are seeing an increased amount of short term leases, like even mm -hmm. six, 12, 18 month leases, whereas the historical norm is three, five, seven, 10 year leases. Are you seeing any of that in your experience, especially with what you just said about, um, you know, tenants being a little unsure about where things are headed? Are you seeing any trends in shorter term leases? Absolutely. And that also goes back to the spec suites because, you know, if ownership doesn't have to spend a ton of money, money to suit your needs. We can go on a shorter term lease. So that is definitely a driver. Also construction costs are really expensive. Um, so right now it seems like they want short term, they'll pay a premium, but the construction costs are so high. So, there's kind of a balancing act of which do you prefer a short term and then you can go find some space that you can move in quick and occupy quick. Um, but if you want it built out to your needs, you're going to have to take a longer term. And we're, we're still seeing companies that are willing to sign seven and 10 year leases because they know they've, they've got their plan. They figured it out. They know what they want to do um, to bring their employees back to work. I've heard that there's um, a big difference between um, well-located suburban office versus downtown office. In your experience, in all the showings that you're doing and, and what you're seeing get leased, are you seeing a difference between well-located, highly amenitized suburban office versus the downtown central business district office? So it's interesting that you say that I had a conversation about that this morning. And I have a little bit of a different opinion. Um, I would still say that the buildings that have positioned themselves with all of the amenities and in the correct spot um, to be highly walkable are the ones that are doing well. And in our market, that is suburban and downtown. So we have plenty of downtown activity um, where companies are still willing to pay for parking and want to be downtown. Um, because those buildings are well positioned with their amenities. So in Cincinnati, we kind of have the best of both worlds. It's, it sounds like a great market for office to be in. Michelle, um, you recently worked on a really interesting project, um, I believe called the Streetman Center. Correct me if I'm saying that incorrectly. Yes. Um, but I think uh, from what I read about it and from what I saw, it sounds like it 
it, it ticks a lot of the boxes that we've been talking about. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about this project that you were heavily involved in leasing up. Can you tell us about the Streetman Center, where it, what, where it is, how you got it leased up, and, and what made it so attractive to get leased up? Yeah, I would love to. So the Streetman Building is one of my favorite buildings and um, that I'm really proud of. So I ownership of that building, bought it in a submarket. It's called Over the Rhine or OTR. And when she bought it, it was um, not a great time and not a very safe area. Um, the Streetman building was the old Streetman Biscuit Company and the bakery. So they made like Zesta crackers and the first Girl Scout cookie there. And she remodeled that building into creative office space. And this particular owner has a very unique eye for what creative office could be. And I would say it was ahead of even the Cincinnati market and created this um, very hip um, exposed ceiling type of vibe with really high-end finishes. And it was the first building that we've had in Cincinnati that was anything like it and demanded really high rates, didn't need to budge off of it um, much and has been highly, highly successful. So the building's at 98% occupied right now. Um, we have one small space left and it is um, doing, it's doing great. So you characterized the setup as creative office space. Can you go into a little more detail about what creative office space means in Cincinnati and who the tenants are? Is it, is it more of a co-working space or is it uh, more of a smaller suite style or is it leased to larger spaces? Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. So each one of the footplates, footprints, they're about 15,000 square feet. We have a rooftop that has some event space um, on it and a rooftop deck with views of the city. All of the ceilings are exposed. It's a very light and airy feel with a lot of windows. Um, also, the windows are operable, so you can open and close them, which is unique for our market, um, but it was really good. You know, fresh air was great. He did like a mother's room in the basement and showers and lockers were right next to a really big gym facility in the city. So just positioned around all of the restaurants and we just brought a coffee shop onto the first floor that ownership built out to bring the amenities to the building. And it's situated in an area where all of, there's a lot of apartments and condos and young talent. So most of our tenants are the creative feel, marketing types, um, startups um, that are trying to attract that young talent. So we found that if you are right next to where they live, they also want to work and then go get you know, happy hour drinks right after. It's all walkable and it's been in a good spot for her. So you mentioned that the spaces are divided up into 15,000 square foot spaces. Is that per floor or are there multiple tenants per floor? And did you have any issue getting 15,000 square feet leased up there? So no, and we've had, each one of the floors are 15,000 square feet. It's a seven story building and the majority of them are full floor users. And then there are a few floors, one, two, and three, where they're split into 5,000 square foot bays. And some of the startups that I referenced, they're the ones who have taken 5,000 square feet at a time. And then an interesting story, we've had a startup who was in 5,000 square feet, now took 12 thousand square feet so they're growing and um that's a tech firm so we're able to accommodate their growth i'm curious um well yeah before i go there um i did i looked at some pictures of this property online and it is quite a striking property uh, particularly on the interior um i think the the designer took some um, yeah, a lot of creativities. I think she took some inspiration from the original cracker 
factory. Um, I saw one photo where it was, you know, kind of a more contemporary, lots of black and whites, contemporary look. And then there were some bright red accent walls. And that was, you know, I, I, I think I read taken as a, as an inspiration from the original like cracker box design. Um, And so just some really unique elements and people love that stuff. Some exposed brick and exposed ceilings, like you had mentioned. So um, seems like a really unique, uh, unique property and, and obviously very desirable and sounds like you did a great job of marketing it and getting it leased up Um, on the, on the other end of uh, the class a, you know, kind of some larger footprint stuff. I'm curious about co-working. Um, yeah. There's been a really, you know, uh, a trend over the last, you know, five to 10 years. I'm wondering if you are seeing um, any patterns or if, you know, you're involved in the co-working space at all, where maybe someone would lease up a small office or a desk in a, in a larger office. Yes, absolutely. So I do have some co-working tenants in some of the buildings that I represent. I don't personally um, lease for the co-working companies, but they're doing really well. And I think a lot of that is driven by some of the smaller sales offices, for example, in our market that don't really need a couple thousand square feet for their own office. They just need a touchdown spot. Um, They've done really well picking up those one-off employees that don't quite need their own office. Um, And even companies who don't need their own office, they just need like a satellite location. And back to the amenities, a lot of the co-working places have just as many amenities as a full building. So it's like people like to go hang. Right. Like a coffee shop in there. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Michelle, as we get ready to wrap up here, I want to ask you about challenges. Um, so first, as the you said you represent over a hundred um, tenant, uh, excuse me, landlord owners. Um, so what sorts of challenges are your clients facing uh, right now in this market? So we do have some challenges, and I will tell you, deals are just taking longer. So um, the whole process of getting a deal done from start to finish, where we used to be able to complete a transaction in just a couple months. Now, decisions are taking a lot longer. There's a lot more that goes into making sure they're planning out the right design. Um, Another challenge is construction prices are so expensive. So trying to get those deals to pencil are tough. And it's also scary for owners to say, okay, I'm going to proactively build out the space or redo this lobby or put this fitness center into the building. It's not cheap. And then you're just crossing your fingers and hoping that it's going to bring the activity. So those are some of my biggest um, challenges and there's a lot riding on you when a client's like, okay, Michelle, are you sure this is going to work? And you're like, yeah, it will do it. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, when you were talking earlier about some of the spec stuff that um, that owners are being advised to do, um, you have to be really confident um, yeah. in your advisor and really confident that this is going to work out um, if you're going to, you know, put in, you know, six figures or more into a space with no tenant lined up. You've got to be really sure that the design and the aesthetics and the location is going to be desirable for uh, for prospective tenants, Absolutely. for sure. Are you seeing any um, any distress in the office space? Um, there's lots of talk about the debt market and um, rising interest rates and interest rates being higher for longer. Are you seeing any of your um, you know clients or landlords starting to get concerned about about the debt space and and uh, be a little more motivated in this market? Absolutely. Yes. Um, Highly motivated. And I think that's just putting more pressure on the leasing team myself. It's whoever's on their front line. You can't just wait for the phone to ring anymore. Owners are definitely demanding, okay, Michelle, I need your whole marketing plan. I need to know who you're calling. And we're, we're picking up the phone and we're having to drum up our own interest um, instead of kind of waiting for it to come to us. There's just a more of a proactive approach to try to get ahead of it. That's for sure. Yeah. Makes a ton of sense. 
Um, Michelle, this has been a great conversation. I loved uh, talking with you about uh, the current office market in Cincinnati and about your rise through JLL. Um, as we wrap up, is there any um, anything else that you want to leave our audience with that we haven't touched on today? Um, I think I'll just say for those who are just getting started in their career, it's a great career to be in. It's highly flexible and um, it's been great for myself and my family. I have a young growing family and I feel like this is a great um, employer and role for me um, to kind of balance and be a mom and a working mom at the same time. And if anybody needs some help along the way, I'm happy to help you. Perfect. And finally, Michelle, if listeners want to connect with you or learn more about you, where would you like to send listeners to? Um, to my LinkedIn page, which is Michelle Klingenberg. Um, and also my email address, which can be on here if you'd like. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. What? <laughs> Yeah, I'll provide uh, links to the, her LinkedIn page and her uh, email address are in the show notes. So if you'd like to reach out to Michelle, um, look in the show notes. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time out today. Sincerely appreciate getting your perspective on the office market, specifically in Cincinnati, hearing your rise through the ranks in JLL and congratulations on all of your success. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much, Jonathan. This was fun. Listeners, if you enjoyed this content, feel free to reach out to either one of us. We love talking about commercial real estate and we would love to connect with you. Thank you so much for listening. You have tons of choices as you listen to podcasts and we are grateful that you listen to this one. Until next time, take care.